I'm a DJ going to decentral, making NFT from Z Files, being crypto poor but J Perry. Ace himself in leadership and communication styles and he's looking to change the world. We have a fireside chat with Simon Bogdanowitz and Charles Hoskinson. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I will be your moderator today for the fireside chat with uh, Sir Charles Hoskinson and he'll be out momentarily. But um, you have to say this has been a great start to a Consensus Festival week. You know, there's a lot always going on, no matter what the market condition is. You know, bull bear, neutral, anything in between. And so uh, it's been an exciting time. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage Mr. Charles Hoskinson. Hi, everybody. Woo. Thank you very much, my friend. Good to see you. Good to see you again. <sighs> How was your flight in from Colorado? Oh, it was just amazing. We actually stopped in Wyoming first and then came down to Colorado, so north to go south. <laughs> a lot of fun. Well, what made you do that? Oh, just a lark. Said, why not? Let's go to Wyoming. <laughs> love, nice. Love the bison. How you been? Good. You're looking good. Well. You lost some weight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yourself as well? No, and no, I've gained weight. <laughs> I, I had to save for winter, just in case it gets cold. It's cold. Yeah, well, it's not cold here this week. You know, we're going to have uh, plus 40 Celsius, plus 100 degrees. So, Simon, our day. first question is, if you were a cookie, what cookie would you be? Mm. Uh, it's, you know, sugar. Sugar? What type of sugar? A lot of types of sugar. Brown sugar. Brown sugar. Ooh. Yeah. The man likes his brown sugar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um. <laughs> All right, all right, give me another one. That was a softball. <laughs> well, Danish butter for me, though. Come on. All right, first question. No, no. Well, thank you again for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, if you're part of the Cardano community, let's, you know, let's hear another shout out to Jaws. I see you back there. I see you up there. And I can hear you. I can hear you and I'm in front of your computers as well on, uh, on Binance and everywhere else that you're tuning in from on YouTube. So thank you for that. So I know that you've been a pivotal part of the, uh, the Financial Innovation Act, also known as the uh, Loomis Gillibrand Act, and wanted to hear your thoughts as it, was, as it dropped yesterday. I wanted to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on the takeaways from that act. Um, what do you think the chances are of it actually passing through Congress? And, um, and what else can potentially, you know, minds like you and others do to push it along or have, you know, a, a break off of that act to actually be passed into, passed through Congress, because as we all know, it's, uh, it's very hard to get anything signed nowadays, especially in this government. Well, it's probably first to understand the backstory of Senator Lummis. Uh, she's been in our industry since 2013. Uh, I think she, that's when she bought her first Bitcoin. And she went to Satoshi Roundtable years ago. And there's many people on our staff who are in the space or innovators in the space, and they, they all know us. And uh, she, her office expressed a desire to get legislation passed last year, and they wrote up a preliminary bill and sent it to us and others as early as, I think it was December of last year. And they've gone through a ton of iterations and discussions, and the bill is very comprehensive. It covers everything from tax treatment of cryptocurrencies. For example, if you're staking and you receive your stake, when does that get taxed? Is it at the moment that the protocol dispenses it, or is it more or like a commodity, like wheat, where you grow the wheat and you get taxed when you harvest it and sell it, for example? Um, to asset classification, they introduce something called ancillary assets. So it's not quite a commodity. It's not quite a security. It's somewhere in between. And it adds some regulatory clarity. They talk about DAOs. They talk about funding for SRO research. Those are self-regulatory organizations. So it's a very comprehensive piece of legislation. It's over 140 pages long, and it is unlikely in its current form to pass because it'd have to go through four different committees to be able to do that. And unless you have like a president and the Senate majority leader and others are really pushing that, and it's a big agenda item like Build Back Better or other things like that, you just don't get that kind of political capital. So really the point of the bill is to be an introducer, a thesis, if you will, and the antithesis is kind of what's coming 
out of the Biden executive order, and they're going to smash together in a very Hegelian way. And then the synthesis of this will be some legislation that the Congress will look at. Now, uh, it's very likely that the politics are such that the House is going to switch from blue to red. And when that occurs, it, the Republicans seem to be at the moment more pro-crypto. And if that's the case, there's a good chance that we will see legislation pass in 2023 in some form. Then the question is, is there enough political support and momentum for that to then go through the White House and they're going to pass it? And that's something that's going to happen. But this is our opportunity as an industry to have a direct say of how we want to be regulated, uh, what are the checks and balances, where are the information asymmetries, what are the moral hazards, and there are certain things I'd love to see that aren't in there, and we're obviously going to have those discussions, and there's other people who have other things. Like, Can you, can you give us a little preview? Like, sure. What would you like, like to see that's not in there right For example, now? everybody says decentralization, decentralization, decentralization. What the hell does that mean? We don't actually have a way of measuring it. You know, with a computer processor or a GPU, you have 3D Mark. You can measure it, you get a number, you, more is better, right? Well, what's the equivalent of that in decentralization? So how decentralized is Bitcoin? You have things like Nakamoto coefficient, but those are partial answers to a much more elegant and broader picture. If you're making the argument that sufficiently decentralized allows you to move from one asset classification, in the case of the SEC, it's saying a security, to another, in this case, a digital commodity. Okay, and there's properties of decentralization. For example, the resolution of information asymmetries or the resolution of systemic risk from a centralized actor who can enter and destabilize the marketplace. So from our view, we need a, a decentralization index that allows you to measure a blockchain and give it a, a number, and then you can say when you're above a certain threshold, you're sufficiently decentralized. Because this is a problem in the bill. It says it has this idea of an ancillary asset and I say, okay, well, you're a commodity, but you still have a filing requirement to the SEC. How do you escape that? We have to go ask the Securities Exchange Commission. And you're back to the same problem of on a case-by-case -case basis, litigation by litigation, you basically get an answer. And that's a terrible way of doing things. You need to have much more explicit, measurable ways of doing things. Second, there needs to be a crypto user's bill of rights that define your rights. And third, there needs to be algorithmic regulation where you figure out how to do transnational arrangements, whether it be things like the Wolfsburg principles or other things like that, with, uh, with algorithms, smart contracts, and uh, then you can have enforceability across borders. Because the world doesn't begin and end at the United States. It turns out that there's other countries, like 197. In fact, there's somebody around here who's been to all of them. Uh, and it would be really nice if we had a transnational system that doesn't require nations to legislate. It can be done through private regulation as opposed to national. So you said um, something about crypto user bill of rights. I'd love to like, have you expand about, on that more and uh, kind of what would you love to see in that? And also um, part two of that question, thinking about the world being obviously borderless and everything else, is there any jurisdiction or any national government or local government outside of Ecuador and, or, or El Salvador and, and, um, and what Dubai is doing that you feel is really on the right track that hasn't really been talked about in the media? Well, according to Max Kaiser, I've been banned from El Salvador. I, that's news to me, but okay. <laughs> Those Team Orange is a little crazy these days. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bill of Rights is just, you have it in this notion of it's a legal doctrine, a promissory estoppel. So if you use open source software, for example, I can't, if the author, author of open source software say, hey, uh, you know, I've changed my mind. I'm just going to rug pull you and change the license, pay me a royalty or stop using my software. Because that would be inconscionable. There'd be a situation you spend tens of millions of dollars building on top of open source software, only then to have somebody start charging you a royalty. Craig Wright actually tried to do this. He said, I'm a Satoshi, and stop using my stuff or I'll you know, fine you. It's, like, it's madness. Uh, so there's this notion that using something, there's implied rights and responsibilities and commercial arrangements behind the fair use of that. And that's the complete open source side. Then you have another group of people that say, well, if I lose a single dollar, somebody should give me a refund and I'm in a class action lawsuit. That's the way other side of the spectrum. So where does that pendulum sit between those two? So you need to define that of, okay, should we have expectations about quality? 
Should we have expectations about monetary policy? Should these be made explicit like a constitution of the system or implicit as an ethos of the system as a whole or emergent as a property of where you sit on the decentralization index? So there's a very close relationship between decentralization governance and the Bill of Rights, including what level of say and control do you have in the system? When you look at proof of work oriented systems, you have almost no control. You own the Bitcoin, but you have no say in the code. You have no say in the governance of the system. Bitcoin gives you nothing. It's just a store of value. When you own a proof of stake style system, many of them like Tezos or Cardano have voting components where you have a say over the governance of the system. You have a say over the consensus of the system and so forth. So you seem to have more rights in these types of systems than other systems. What does that mean then in terms of fair use? And, uh, and can those be revoked and under what circumstances and so forth. For example, as regulators become more clever, they might start saying, we like proof of stake, but if you're from Iran or Russia or North Korea, you can't vote. Well, how do you enforce that in a global protocol? You know, and these types of things. So these are the delicate edge cases that are working through and the anarchistic elements of the space say, well, fuck the system, everybody, you just have to deal with it and accept it, honey badger don't care. And other people say, well, no, we need to fit into a rules-based international order. We, we have to figure out a way to make this work. I think, again, it's, it's going to be like that synthesis where they're going to argue for a bit and then find a fair compromise. And legislatively, that can be accomplished. It could be also accomplished through a self-regulatory process or just accomplished through standards like the Internet was with TCPIP. But you need to settle on something in that respect. And, you know, we're much more on our side involved in decentralization indexes, we're going to set one up at the University of Edinburgh. We have papers we'll write over the summer. We're just starting to think about what a Bill of Rights would look like, because you have to look at it through the lens of governance and the lens of decentralization. So there's a cart before the horse component, and it's an industry-wide conversation. Yeah, no, I think it's very interesting. It makes me also think about um, how many different types of like DAOs they are, there, there are, and yeah. hybrid DAOs. And I don't know if you've seen that meme going around Twitter, but everyone's in a boat. And there's a hole in the boat, and this is like, hey, there's a hole in the boat. Somebody else says, I like that hole. And, and Susie says, our, our, our boat has a hole, but so does that boat. So that means we're on the right track. Somebody else says, leave everyone else alone. The hole is the hole because if the hole is there. No one else should be talking about the hole. So I, I think about that too in terms of like, hey, how do we come together and, and have consensus, but at the same time make everyone feel like they're empowered to like have their own yeah. say in a you know, kind of equal and equitable way. Yeah, and how we tend to do that in practice is that you allow, under non-urgent scenarios, gradual uh, convergence to a decision. So if you have the luxury of time, you can have a long arc deliberative process to get you to where you need to go. If you don't have the liberty of time, then usually what you do is you anoint some group, usually small or an individual, to kind of lead you out of it. So in the case of a crisis like a hole in the boat, Bob gets to plug it. The Romans did this. They had two consuls and a senate, and they had uh, kind of an underhouse, and we based our bicameral model in many respects on this. But they also had the notion of a dictator, like Cincinnatus was one, and uh, Sulla was one. And they said, all right, you're in charge for a period of time. Go win the war, go fight the thing, and then your powers will expire at some point. If we be careful, because sometimes dictators disagree on the uh, length of uh, time, and that's actually where the word comes from. But a good governance system should have both properties in certain respects. If there's a crisis, there's the ability to ameliorate that in an orderly way. And if it's uh, other concerns like fundamental rights or competitiveness or strategy, it may take years to converge. And that's okay. It depends on the use case of the system. Um, if I'm building on it, I'd like to know that I'm not building on quicksand and it changes very slowly. One of the things that made the internet so successful is the internet doesn't change a lot. So people felt very comfortable betting on it rather than building comp competitive structures to change it. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're like, well, I can live with this and I can build on top of this and build bespoke protocols and so forth. Uh, whereas if the internet changed a lot, like the OSI model, for example, then it, you probably wouldn't end up, uh, you wouldn't get where you need to go. You know, you, you would be like, ah, I'm not so sure what version do I support? What do I do? Like, what if there was 26 versions of IPv? What would Cisco do? You know, these type of things. Yeah, no, that's fair. And speaking of, uh, of, of numbers and building, um, I want to congratulate you on almost nearly surpassing 1,000 projects building simultaneously on Cardano. So, to give it up. 
that's it's been announced. It's been in the news, we, we, and it's been congratulated the wrong guy. I didn't do it. They did. Yeah. Well, they did it behind a I'm fearless like, leader. I'm on the other side. I'm the spectator to that one. You know, <laughs> actually, we have a community event tonight, and I said we'll get a few hundred people. Two thousand people have registered. We got like eighty projects showing up. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Anybody going there tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm glad some people like it. <laughs> Fantastic. And then um, I read also, uh, I think I believe it was in Cointelegraph, that over 100,000 new wallets uh, were created alone in the month of March as well. So yeah. given the market conditions. Oh, it's yeah. great. You know, we're, we're consistently in the top five of transaction volume. Number one for GitHub commits. Five million assets issued on the chain. Over 1,000 dApps deployed. And we're just getting started. You know, it's a lot of fun. 900 plus projects funded with Catalyst. Uh, we're, the, the democratic elements of the chain are really waking up. And we're having deep and detailed conversations about the tail end of the roadmap, Basho and Voltaire. So the scale is coming rapidly. And at the same time, governance is really starting to shape up and it's becoming a, a beautiful members-based ecosystem. So no pyramids, just circles. And that's a beautiful thing as well. So it, it exceeded my wildest expectations of what Cardano could achieve. And we did it all with principles, 140 papers and formal methods, never compromised on that. And I'm proud of that, especially as other things explode, which shall remain nameless. And other things look like the old Nintendo where you have to take it out, blow it, put it in, you know, that thing. That also shall remain nameless. You guys know what I'm talking a about. A little nostalgia. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we're, and they, everybody said those people were going to surpass us. And like the tortoise, we just stayed true to form and little by little moved an inch a day. And it turned out we made some damn progress. Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. So, yeah, so about... I think just under or over 100 projects built on Cardano, about 1,000 of the pipelines. So it's a 10x to the, the current numbers, which is great. And then you have a big upcoming uh, hard fork upgrade at the end of uh, this month. Uh, I believe it's pronounced uh, Vassil. Yeah, it's after Vassil Dubov, who's a good, good old friend of mine, and he mm -hmm. recently passed away. And we thought it was a good tribute uh, to kind of send him off that way. He planted over 10,000 trees throughout his lifetime. He was an amazing guy. He studied math, and uh, he was just the nicest person you'd ever meet. We did the second anniversary of Cardano in Bulgaria with him in Plodiv, and uh, we didn't have a big thing. We just went outside to the Ag University and planted a bunch of trees with him, the ginkgo trees. So uh, it's a major update. Pipelining is coming. Uh, there's a lot of enhancements to the Plutus development experience. Uh, the D parameter is completely removed. So you know, all those safety switches are turned off. It really does feel like uh, the, the final finishing pieces in a very elegant initial foundation for Cardano. And it primes Cardano for mass scale, and it primes Cardano for all the really interesting governance conversations that are coming. There's a lot of people that are willing, capable, and ready to lead, and they're already doing it. They're building tons of great infrastructure. So the next 18 months are going to be just a wild magic carpet ride as those people rise up and they start accelerating. So our best days are definitely ahead of us. And the fact that this is going to be a seamless experience, knock on wood, you know, uh, is a testimony to the upgradability of the system. The hard fork commentator has been great. We've done many hard forks as an ecosystem, and they've been incredibly smooth. You blink and you've missed it. You know, you don't have this, well, will they fork? Will they not fork? It failed on the test net. Oh, well, like certain other blockchains that shall remain nameless. Yeah, and w when was the last hard fork? That was last year in, I think... October, November, maybe December. It was, uh, I can't remember the exact time it went through. And, oh, actually, no, it was last year. It was the Alonzo hard fork that we did with smart contracts. That was September. That's and perfect. I think we did a small hard fork a little afterwards to kind of clean up a few things post Alonzo. So there might have been a December fork. I can't remember. But it shows you it's like it's, it's just a thing. It's like an Android update, you know, these types of things. Nobody really thinks too much about it. It's not this catastrophic, oh, God, will we be able to pull it off, you know, because upgradability was built into the system. Because no matter where you start, if you have the capacity to upgrade the system over time, you can absorb any feature or capability. And so that's a huge competitive advantage, and it just blows my mind that only a few chains really took this seriously, like Tezos did, and we did, and a few others did. But it's not a core feature of Bitcoin or Ethereum, nor is it in the Ethereum 2 roadmap. In fact, Vitalik has written the opposite. He's, oh, we can't do blockchain governance. That's, that's a bad idea. Okay. So what happens when you have 150 million users? How will you sort all of that out without just giving yourself dictatorial control? Well, you don't need to. Well, then you look like Bitcoin. 
in which case you can't upgrade at all. So you better be happy with what you got because you, you're stuck with it for a decade. Yeah, that's, that, you bring up a good point. Do you have any kind of views on Ethereum 2.0 and when that may happen and what that's going to mean to um, you know, the rest of the ecosystem and Cardano? Yeah, so he, tale of two blockchains. We started our proof of stake agenda in 2016. Uh, and we wrote a series of papers, the GKL model, Ouroboros Classic, Prowse, Genesis, Kronos, and Ledger Redux, and, and soon to be Laos, and all these other papers, like 12 papers, and there's thousands of citations. And everybody said, oh God, you can't do that. If you do peer review, you'll be too slow. It'll be too hard to get something to market. Well, the first version came out in 2017. The, the version people care about, Shelley, the Ouroboros Prowse, came out in 2020. Ethereum started their proof of stake research agenda in 2014. And they've been the game longer and they still have yet to roll it out because it's really, really hard. And for the first half of the agenda, they said, we're going to be engineers. We don't need to write papers. We don't need to do any of these things. And it failed and failed. And the team fractured and one did like Casper Labs and other people did other stuff. Then they said, yeah, maybe you should write research papers. So they finally did. And they published the paper. So we finally can read the protocol and some people had some issues with it. Other people liked it. Okay. It looks like they have a viable design. It looks like they know how to build that viable design. It looks like they've built that viable design. So there's a certain degree of inevitability to some form of upgrade to Ethereum to a proof of stake system. That will take a while to work its way through. And if I had to guess, I'd say that it won't be fully operational until deep into 2023, maybe even 2024. Uh, but, you know, we'll see uh, how long it takes and what they go through. But you have to understand, you can't just design a consensus protocol. You have to design a consensus protocol and a network protocol at the same time for proof of stake. Because all the things you do in proof of work to defend your network protocol with proof of work are super easy. You, you have algorithmic work to rely on. It's a DDoS control mechanism. It prevents against asymmetrical attacks and so forth. Well, when you go to proof-of-stake land, you introduce a ton of new attack vectors to your system. And that's, if you're not careful, what causes network partitions, it causes forks, it causes all kinds of terrible things. So you think you have it, and then it breaks, and you're like, shit, how do I put it back together? And it's like Humpty Dumpty, and it's like all the king's men are trying to put the pieces back. So you have to be very careful with it. So what ends up happening is you get to about 85% of design, and that 15% tail just goes and goes and goes and goes. It took us four years to design our network stack. Four years. You know, and so it's not trivial. It's not easy. And there's lovely papers that come out of David Shee's lab at Stanford and other places, and they talk about these things. So I think they have to innovate in three different dimensions at the same time with a moving car. They have to design a better network model. They have to design a better consensus model and fire all their miners. That's a hard layoff. Uh, and then they also have to get their programming model to work in a sharded environment. Account-based programming has global state, and it's really hard to shard it. You have tons of availability concerns. You have deadlocks and all these things. This is why, you know, CSP exists and these other things exist, because it, parallelization of an account model is really hard to do in practice. Now, contrast that with our accounting model, extended UTXO. It's got local state, and it's built for parallelization. It doesn't care how many threads you have. They don't interact more often than not. And when they do, you can accommodate that. So given their accounting model, their network model, and other things, to go from one to N is really, really hard to do, which is why they're hedging their bets. And they're investing so much money in Starkware and all these other things for recursive Starks. And the layer two space, like the polygons of the world, are, are gaining traction because those are a halfway house solution. Now, meanwhile, there is already Ethereum 2 out here, Ethereum 1.5, it's Polkadot. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the model. Vitalik should have just done that. Uh, they borrowed Ouroboros Prowse and they made some improvements on their side and they've done some great things there and parachains is a good idea. So all they had to do is just follow Gavin Wood and they would already have a significantly better product than the one they had. But for whatever reason, the politics worked out in a way where they didn't do that. And that was just surprising to me. I figured that they could have set differences aside and chosen that path. They also had another path to proof of stake, uh, for those who like history in the space. It was out of Cornell. That was Elaine Shee's work when she was there with the IC3. It was called Snow White. 
And we were competitors with them. We published Ouroboros two weeks before Snow White came out. Then they published Sleepy. Then we published Prowess. So we were going back and forth and like beating the shit out of each other in an academic death match that nobody cares about. And, uh, and I, was, I thought for sure, because Vitalik was friends with Elaine, that he would just be like, well, why am I designing a protocol? Cornell is doing it for me. Let me just go do Snow White and use this and add my requirements on top. They didn't do it. They went for proof of stake plus sharding plus all these other features and functionality. It was a very strange way of doing it because there's too much base complexity in that protocol. You build like an onion. You start with a base model of security. That's what we did with GKL. You prove it works under optimistic conditions and then you make the conditions more pessimistic over time. So static and federated and synchronous network model then dynamic and uh, you know model and it's uh, anybody can join and then asynchronous network and so forth. And you just keep working your way through and you resolve things, like you decouple the clock, and we did that with Ouroboros Kronos. But each of those is a paper and each of those have to go through peer review because they're delicate models and if you don't do it right, the whole house of cards comes collapsing down. Protocol design is very, very hard. And, and we've seen time and time again, like the hype, the marketing, the media kind of get, get ahead of itself and then um, you know, kind of people start forgetting like, oh wait, Things take time. It, it yeah. takes slow build. You have to test. You have to peer, peer review. You have to base things around research and academics and science and the math behind it. Right. Yeah. So I remember the Ethereum people say, "I have no technical skills and I'm just a hype guy." You know. That's, <laughs> that's the other thing is that they've removed a lot of collaboration in the industry. It, 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 we're all on the same side on the academic side. You know, the papers, many different authors. Everybody cites each other. We compete with Algorand in the market but we cite each other's papers. We compete with Avalanche in the market, but there's citations on both sides. So everybody knows each other. It's a small group and we all work together. The people who don't tend to show up more often than not are on the Ethereum side. And only recently have they been. And in many cases, they've been exceedingly hostile and dismissive. Like Vitalik went to Reddit as his medium attacking the Ouroboros design and so forth. I saw him at many academic conferences. We were at the Shanghai Winter School together. He was standing five feet away from me. Didn't have any problems while all the scientists were there, but I guess on Reddit, he's, he's got that decision. And so that's, that's the other thing that's been so distasteful, I'd say, about this, is this presumption of success and this presumption that these are easy problems when, in fact, they're very difficult problems, and this presumption that uh, you don't need to work with anybody or talk to anybody, or they have to learn how to collaborate with them. Meanwhile, academia has been doing cryptography and protocol design for more than 50 years. We didn't go to crypto and Eurocrypt and say, accommodate us. We said, we'll follow the peer review system that Eddie Shamir and Ron Rivest and Leonard Adelman and these other people followed. These are important systems. They have a reason they exist. They're double blind. When a paper is submitted, no names are on it. You don't know who the referees are and they review the merit of the work and there's a back and forth refereeing process and they make a decision whether to accept or reject the paper. And when they reject, they don't just reject, they give you a reason why. Half of our papers get rejected the first time through or more and we have to clean them up and fix them and submit them again. And I cannot tell you how many problems in small flaws and subtle conversations have resulted from that. The other thing is how do you build a decentralized brain? If you rely on the heroic brilliance of a founder, what happens when the founder gets hit by a bus? What happens if the founder retires? What if the founder pulls a Satoshi and just disappears? The whole point of the peer review... Exactly. And then the whole point of the, the, the peer review process is to, is to decentralize your brain. There are people in India who work on it, China and Japan, Venezuela, all across the world. And there's no canonical language or geography or any of these things. And it's an endless well of refreshing because there's always new graduate students. There's always new postdocs. There's always new professors. So you say 50 years from now, the process will be the same. The people will be the same. We were one of the first, not the only now, there's Al Grand and others who are following, but we were one of the first projects to embrace that. It felt so simple and natural, and we got brutally criticized for saying, we're so slow and it's unnecessary. Uh, Chico Crypto made this lovely video on papers, 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 papers. You know, it's a pretty good video, actually. Um, and, and now it turns out there's some vindication to that, because we're actually first to market in many things, and all the things are locking together beautifully, like Mithril and Extended Utixo and Ouroboros. And as predicted, a lot of the other people are starting to run into the stumbling blocks that we ran into 
four years ago. And we're saying, welcome to the party. You know, yeah. good luck fixing it. <laughs> and, and you leave some uh, blueprints behind for them, right? But not, not everything. No patents. It's all open source. Uh, all our code is open source. That's the other thing about the tribalism in the space. It's like we wrote 140 papers, not for us, for you guys. So anyone in the audience, anyone in the world, including competitors, can and have used it. Amina Protocol is using some of this stuff. Fly Client from the Bitcoin space, which is now in Zcash and other things. It's based on Nipa Pows, a paper we wrote. Um, as I mentioned, Polkadot with Ouroboros Prows. Uh, the extended UTXO model is the only way to introduce smart contracts in a sensible way to Bitcoin if they so desire it. You know, they're trying with simplicity in these jet things. It'll never happen. Extended UTXO is the way to do it. So we're kind of beta testing how Bitcoin would get smart contracts. Uh, the sidechain protocols that we've developed, all these types of things. And again, it's all open source. Anybody can use it. Anybody can play around with it. And we love it when that happens. If somebody comes and says, I'm building a new cryptocurrency, I want to use it. We say, great, come talk to us. We'll talk to you. It's free. Real free. Not like free lunch. Real free. Yeah. And not like universal basic income free either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, so we're going to wrap it up here, but I want to leave the audience and everyone tuning in uh, around the world with one more question. And it's like in, in a market like this, um, I know you've been quoted on you, you know, kind of a few different YouTube videos of yours saying like, all I do is, is work and build. And that's all I focus in and concentrate on. And it well, really... That's not true. I have a personal life. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to... Yeah. So, but that being said, love, if you could give um, a little word of wisdom from like, hey, how what do you do or what keeps you motivated? What are some of the things you do in your personal life that keeps you going with a work-life balance and, and, a, and kind of keeps you striving through to the other side of, of bear markets, whatnot, that um, all the projects, all the leaders, all the people thinking about getting in the space are in the space and one capacity or another can learn from uh, a little bit of your genius. So I, I think the analogy is that the bear market is the building market. Build a bear, you know, it's right. the market you build stuff in. And everybody's friendly in a bear market. Everybody's collaborative. It's easy to have meetings with people. Nobody really is hostile because they're not fighting over this hyperinflated pie. The poaching goes down. You get much better conversations. The conferences get a little skinnier. So instead of these massive, literally, they put a fucking golden bull at the Bitcoin Miami. I mean, it's like the, the, the old is the new, right? You know, I, Moses coming down with the tablets. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it, when you exit a bull market and you enter a bear market, it's very collaborative and it's much more enjoyable. It's the best times I've had in the space have been during bear markets. Bull markets are crazy. You get so much hype and FOMO and there's so much growth and you get super unrealistic expectations and then you get a lot of fair weather people that show up that don't care at all about the principles, the mission, the values, the technology adoption. It's just all about get rich quick, you know? And so it's, it's an irritant because they get in the way of collaboration and they get in the way of progress and adoption. And they don't want to have a conversation about technological things. They want to have a conversation about high yields and these types of things. And in many cases, they embrace ponsonomics uh, and the same schemes are recycled on lending and stable coins and other things again and again. I was in the stable coin space pretty much before anybody else. Uh, we did BitShares, Dan Larimer and I, back in 2013. We created BitUSD with BitShares. It was an over-collateralized um, US dollar backed coin that used BitShares as back. So it was an algorithmic stable coin. And we had a DEX. Now this was pre-Ethereum. That's how far back it was. Well, one of the initial designs we ruled out was partially collateralized algorithmic stable coins because in the modeling, it has a bank run in certain failure states. So that's an idea eight years ago, but then suddenly it gets recycled in a bull market, and then you see the consequences of that being recycled. The next bull market will get recycled again, but this time will be different. They always say that, yeah, right? Says, yeah. You know, so, so to me, you have to balance the two. And then the other thing is on the work-life balance, getting to the, the soul of the question, you have to have a sanctuary, whether it be big or small. You have to have a place you can go where you can truly shut off and stop listening to the web and disconnect and just enjoy life and be in the moment. Uh, I love nature. Be so your, Be in your happy place. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. I love nature. I have a ranch. But everybody has that place. And as long as you can create that sanctuary, I think you can get through pretty much anything. Yeah. 
No, fantastic. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed our talk. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Please guys. do stick around for the, the next panel coming up. And again, thank, let's thank Mr. Charles Oxenson. Thanks, everybody.